Hi there, Pastor Barney Schwenke, Faithway Baptist Church here in Leesburg, Virginia. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video here we're about to show you. Uh, my prayer is that God will use this sermon today in conjunction with you belonging to a good Bible teaching, Bible preaching local church where you can get involved and you can serve to help you grow in your walk with God, to make you more like Jesus Christ. I always tell our church family when they come walking through these doors, my goal as your pastor is to help you see Jesus so you don't leave the same way you came in. And that's my prayer for you today. By the way, if the message today is a blessing to your heart, would you consider giving towards the media ministry here at Faithway? It takes a lot of money to be able to produce these videos and to stream them from our website. You, you can find the description in the link below, a link to the website. And in that description, um, it'll tell you how to give and be a part of the ministry here. Thank you so much for joining us. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you could turn to the book of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 26. And our text this morning, as I read, actually read it a few minutes ago to you as we started our service together, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's gathered together with his disciples in the upper room. And they are going to be remembering what the, the, the Jewish people called the Passover, the Passover feast. Today we've met to worship and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And our text today is giving us the story of the last meal that Jesus Christ will ever eat with his disciples in the upper room. Now, we don't know where the upper room is. If you go to Jerusalem, there are a couple of different places. People try to tell you this is the upper room. Really what it is, it's a bunch of, uh, or it's a couple of people trying to make money from tour groups is what it happens to be. We have no idea where the upper room was, but Jesus met in a room that was above overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and they, he would have had to rent that, rent, rented that room, or maybe someone provided it for him, but he would have met with his disciples there because they were not from Jerusalem. Remember, they were from Nazareth and other parts of Israel, but they would come together. All the Jewish people would make a pilgrimage to the temple on Passover. It was a ritual that the Jewish people would go through almost every single year. If they could make it, they would do so. And so you have all of the Jews who are convening upon Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And you know the story of Jesus, right? How in a few moments after this meal, he's going to be betrayed by Judas. And then he's going to be falsely arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he's going to endure mock trials and he will be falsely accused. He'll be beaten with a, with a cat of nine tails. He will have his beard plucked out from his face. He's going to go through immense torture. And finally, he's going to be led to an old rugged cross where they will nail his hands and his feet to that cross and he will hang suspended between heaven and earth and he will die for the sins of the world. But this is the final meal that Jesus will share with his disciples. And as he is going to now reveal to them the great sacrifice that he would make on behalf of their sin and on behalf of, of mankind, as they partake of this meal, Jesus instructs them that every time they observe the Lord's Supper, they should do so in remembrance of him. You know that song, Phil, we just sang that talked about my Jesus fair? The chorus, I don't know if you caught it, it said, In joyful grief I lift my voice. How can a Christian, how can there be joy and grief existing at the same time? Doesn't that sound weird? But as Christians, we come to the Lord's Supper, and it's like there's two parallel tracks, joy and grief. It's like you go to a funeral celebration for someone who knew the Lord is their Savior. Yes, your heart is sad, but at the same time, you're happy because there's no more sickness and no more pain and no more suffering. They're with the Lord, and they've lived a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And so there's grief and there's joy at the same time. That's what the Bible says, that when we come to the Lord's Supper, we, the way we are to approach it. Our text this evening, or this morning, rather, in Matthew chapter 26, takes place during the Passover time. And Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead to prepare the upper room for this observance. Passover was a meal that had been celebrated by the Jewish people for centuries. If you know the Old Testament, the book of Exodus tells the story of the exodus of the people of Israel from the land of Egypt in which they were being held slaves. And God delivered them from slavery and led them into the promised land. And as they were getting ready to leave Egypt and go into the wilderness and begin their trek towards the land that God had promised them, on that fateful night, right before they were to leave, the Bible tells us that he instructed the people of God to sacrifice a lamb, 
And the blood of that lamb was to be placed on the doorpost and above the door. And as the door, as the, as the death angel passed through the land of Egypt that night, all the firstborn children of Egypt were to be killed, except upon the homes where the blood was applied. And as the Lord passed over Egypt and he took all the firstborn, when he saw the blood applied to the door, he would pass over that house. That's where we get the name Passover from. The blood covered that house and protected them. And so as the Jewish people gathered there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and Jesus and his disciples, they met together for this meal, they were prepared for this dinner where they, they would eat a meal consisting of bitter herbs, unleavened bread, and a lamb that was sacrificed. There was a specific order that was given for the Passover supper that is found in the book of Exodus. The first thing that they did is they drank a cup in Luke chapter 22, verse number 17. They drank a, a cup of red wine that was mixed with water. The second thing that they would do after they drank that cup of wine is they would partake of a ceremonial hand washing, which symbolized the need for spiritual and moral cleansing. After they washed their hands, they would then eat the bitter herbs. Now, I don't know very many people that like to eat bitter herbs. Uh, not me. If I have to eat something that tastes bitter, I want to have something sweet with it, right? Like there's some vitamins that I take that have a horrible after, aftertaste to it. So I, I try to always make sure that I drink it or, you know, have some sort of like a, a sugary type drink when I take that. So that way it masks the taste of the bitter herbs. And the people of Israel, they would eat the bitter herbs and they would not enjoy it as it went down. But it was a symbolic, symbolical reminder of the slavery and the bondage that they were in in the land of Egypt. It was certainly a bitter experience for the people of God. And then they would drink a second cup of wine, at which time the head of the house would go through the story of the Passover. By the way, it was very important to the Jewish people that, that the head of the house would recite and recount the Old Testament to his family. It was something that they grew up with. And can I encourage you, dads, Please make sure that you spend time teaching your children the truths of the gospel, of the Bible. Hide God's word in your heart and teach your children the truths of God's word. So the head of the house would explain the meaning of the Passover supper. And then they would sing the first two of the Halal Psalms, which were Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. They would just sing it. It was basically written as a song for the people of Israel. And after they got done singing that song, the lamb would be brought out and the head of the house would distribute a little bit of the lamb along with the unleavened bread, and they would eat that together as a family. Now, the unleavened bread symbolized haste. Because if you're going to go cook bread in a, in a bread maker or in an oven, you understand you make the dough, right, and you add the yeast to it, and then you got to let it sit and you got to let it rise. If you try to throw the dough right into the oven, you know, you're not going to get the beautiful loaf. You're going to get pizza dough, right? So you're going to get something flat. You got to give it time for the yeast to work and to activate to give it that fluffy texture. And so, because the children of Israel, the very next day, were going to be leaving for the land of uh, for the wilderness and leaving their homes behind, they didn't have time to prepare. And so, they ran out of the door, so to speak. And so, that's what the symbology behind the unleavened bread was the, the flat bread, the matzah cracker that we hold in our hands. And then they would conclude the meal by singing the rest of the halal psalms. It's Psalm 115 through Psalm 118. And that is what the Jewish people would do to celebrate Passover. The sun would be down, the day would be getting dark, and they would be celebrating the, the Passover and remembering the event in which the blood was shed and the lamb was sacrificed. You say, that's really cool. That's a neat picture in the Old Testament, especially they would put the blood, right? If this is the cross behind us, they would put the blood on either side of the doorpost of the lamb, and then they would put it at the very top. And if you were just to draw the lines and connect it, what would you get? You would get a cross. The symbology in the Old Testament is really cool. And it's neat how way back then there was a picture of what Jesus one day would do on the cross of Calvary, but the Jewish people for centuries failed to see him, the Messiah, the sacrificial lamb, who would come to take away the sin of the world. And now Jesus is with his 12 disciples in the upper room. Now re remember, these men have longed for the Messiah. They, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He, they believed that he was the one, but they failed to see in the Passover Jesus Christ himself. They failed to recognize him. In fact, all of the Jewish people at, at that time failed to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. 
but the Passover pointed to the coming Christ, but most of them failed to see that Jesus was the Christ. Look at verse number 26 if you have your Bibles. Matthew 26, verse 26. It tells us here that Jesus is about to break the bread and he is going to basically take on, he is going to, uh, the symbology, he said Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, not typically what the typical head of the Jewish household would say, he says something different. He said, take, eat, this is my body. In other words, Jesus is saying something that they've never heard before during a Passover meal. He is saying, this bread that you are about to eat symbolizes the great sacrifice that I will soon be making to provide for your redemption. Jesus is going to offer himself as the atoning sacrifice of sin. His body would be offered on the cross, facing the wrath of God, and he would endure the righteous judgment in order to pay the sin debt that those disciples had because of the way they lived their life. Jesus would soon go to that cross and shed his blood in order to ransom mankind from their sin. In order for atonement to be made, the Bible says that blood must be shed and a perfect sacrifice must be offered. And what Jesus is saying in verse number 26 is a statement that is so unbelievable the disciples just don't even comprehend it. Jesus is saying that he alone was worthy to become that sacrifice. Now, a sacrificial lamb was slain on Passover that day. It would be offered on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, to appease the righteousness of God for sin. And while this was faithfully observed year after year after year, that's just it. Every single year, a new lamb had to be killed. Every year, a spotless lamb was killed by the high priest, and the blood was taken into the Holy of Holies, and it was sprinkled there every single year it was repeated. But the Lamb of God has now come, and he would finally and he would fully appease the righteousness of God as he died in our place for our sins. If you want to turn to Hebrews, I love the book of Hebrews because it gives us so much typology of Jesus Christ. Keep your finger there in Matthew, but turn over to Hebrews chapter number 7. And I want you to see in verse number 26, the Bible says this, For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. Fast forward to Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4. This is a powerful passage of scripture. If you're ever talking to someone from a Jewish background, open up to the book of Hebrews and show them what it says about what Jesus did. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4, it says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Now, can the blood of bulls and goats cover sin? It did in the Old Testament. Year after year after year after year, it covered the sin. But like Paul said there, or the author of Hebrews said, it's impossible that the blood of goats and lambs can take away sin. What can wash away my sin? What can cleanse me? Wherefore, verse number 5, when he cometh into the world, he saith, the sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In other words, someone perfect had to shed their blood, a body, a human being had to die in the place of mankind. And that is the significance, if you want to turn back to Matthew chapter number 26. Jesus declared in verse number 26 that this body that he had, it would be broken for them. Verse 27, he took the cup and gave it and gave it thanks to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of of sins. He's saying, I will shed my blood for the remission of mankind. And although the disciples, remember, these guys had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Thomas and Peter and the disciples had made confession with their mouth that Jesus was the Messiah. These men, even though they were good moral people who were instructed by God himself in the ways of life, they too needed to be saved from their sins. And Jesus says in verse number 28, my blood will be shed for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins. 
How did Jesus take away my sin and your sin? How did Jesus change the, the trajectory of history? Every year, right? The temple, the lamb would be slaughtered, and the blood would be applied year after year after year. How did Jesus change that? Well, the Bible says that Jesus died on a cross, and he became our substitute. Romans chapter 3, verse number 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on a cross, and he shed his blood, so that way you would not have to die on a cross and shed your blood for your sins. It's called the substitutionary atonement. Big word. But when you're playing basketball and you're in the third quarter and you're a starter and you need to be able to catch your breath, what does the coach do, right? He, he brings the sub. He brings the guy that's sitting on the bench into the game. And you come out and you get your water and you drink. You take a little bit of a break and your substitute plays in your place for a little while. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. You and I deserve to be on that old rugged cross because of our sin. And yet Jesus died for you. There was no other way. The wages, the payment of sin is death. Christ had to die in order for sin to be paid for. I want you to look at verse number 29. Look what Jesus says. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that these disciples failed to grasp the enormity of this encounter. And while they celebrated that Passover, that particular celebration that they have would be completely unnecessary going forward. There is no longer a need for you to celebrate the Passover, right? Because Jesus Christ has done it for you. Now, I know there are some Christians that observe the Passover and some Jewish people that do, but there's not a need to do it. Because Jesus died on the cross. It is finished. The Passover would be replaced with the celebration of remembrance of his glorious sacrifice and his atoning death. And so that's what we are doing this morning. The Passover meal has been replaced by the Lord's Supper, by communion. And so today it is a joyful grief that brings us together, thanking God for what he did for us on the cross, and remembering that it is us that deserve to be there on that cross. And when you think about the enormity of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ did for you by dying in your place, ladies and gentlemen, that should bring a tear to your eye. When you think about you deserve to be there, but Jesus died for you. I love John 3, 16. Probably the most famous verse in the New Testament, right? For God so loved the world. Put your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you, you put your name there, believe in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. The Passover is now replaced with the celebration, the Lord's Supper. And we gather together and we re remember this new covenant Jesus talks about that there. It's a big phrase. But it's a new establishment. It is a new celebration. It is a new thing that he is now incorporating for the local church. And Jesus is telling his disciples, he's going to go on, and he is going to, in verse number 30, he's going, 31, he's going to talk to Peter, and he's going to say, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, no, Lord, I will never deny you. And then you know what happened that night, right? The rooster crowed three times, and Peter had denied Christ. And so... Jesus was talking to his disciples about a great challenge that was going to come in the upcoming days. And the one that followed, uh, that they followed, the Messiah, Jesus himself, would be crucified, he would be buried in a borrowed tomb, and these disciples would question their faith. They would begin to wonder, was my three and a half years of wandering with Christ in the wilderness, was it all in vain? Was following Christ and giving up fishing and giving up my life to follow him? Did I waste my life? And they would begin to question the validity of their faith when Jesus was lying in that tomb. And Jesus, and though they didn't understand it, Jesus makes a very significant promise in verse number 29. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it again in my Father's kingdom. You know what Jesus is telling his disciples? Even though they didn't understand it? 
He is saying, I'm going to go to the cross and shed my blood and I'm going to die, but death will not hold me. I will rise again triumphantly from the grave and I will ascend back into the Father and there I will intercede on your behalf. And so Jesus is making, is in heaven right now, making preparation for all who receive him to come once again into his presence. Jesus reveals in verse number 29 that there will one day be another celebration in heaven. And that day, we're not going to gather in heaven to celebrate the Passover. And we're not going to gather in heaven to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know what we're going to do? It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. The Marriage Feast of the Lamb. We saw that in Revelation chapter 22. And there we will gather around the throne of God and we will eat and we will partake with Jesus Christ on that day. Jesus reveals another celebration that one day we will enjoy. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. And all who are alive today who have trusted Christ, and all who are dead who have trusted Christ, they will be face to face with the living Savior one day in heaven. And so this morning, with joyful grief, we come together to celebrate what Jesus has done for us on our behalf. Do you recognize this morning the substitutionary atonement of Christ for you? The significance of that? You deserve to be on that cross. And yet Jesus died for you. And as a result of his death, by your faith in him, you have a promise of eternal life. And so when you take your last breath here on this earth, the glorious news of the gospel is that will be your, the next breath you take will be your first breath in eternity forever and ever and ever. That is why Paul, because of the significance of the Lord's Supper, that's why Paul revealed that we must examine our hearts prior to partaking of this meal. And so, before we gather together and we have the little cups and we take the Lord's Supper together, if there's anything in your life that you were not, un that you were not willing to deal with, can I encourage you to either deal with it with God or to refrain from taking the Lord's Supper today? If you're not saved here this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I urge you to respond to God's gracious offer of salvation today. God loved you even though you were a sinner. And he sent Jesus to die in your place on the cross. So you don't have to die. And if you repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in him, the Bible says you can have eternal life. If you're not a child of God today, would you do that? Jesus paid the debt that you owed, died in your place, and you can be forgiven of your sin and reconciled to God through his precious gift. Christian, can you say with the Apostle Paul, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift? I hope you can do that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, I ask you this morning as we take some time now and celebrate with the juice and with the cracker, the blood and the body of Christ that was broken for us. I pray that we would do it with clean hearts, with pure hands, Lord, truly believing what you've done for us and thanking you for the enormity and the blessing of the unspeakable gift that you've given to us through Jesus Christ. It's with joyful hearts, but grieving hearts, we thank you. Amen. Well, you survived an entire message with us today. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, we trust the video today has been a blessing to you. You know, every message that I preach, I always try to bring it back to the importance of, number one, telling people everywhere we go about Jesus Christ. And number two, making sure that we as individuals make our life with God, our personal walk with God, the most important thing of our day. If there's ever anything that we can do for you or your family to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, would you please reach out to us? You can visit our website, visitfaithway.com, and there you'll find a link to get in touch with us. And we'd love to hear from you. If you made a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, awesome, that's wonderful. We would love to be able to talk to you about that and give you some resources that can help you grow in your walk with God. So let us know if there's ever anything that we can do for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.